Bacchileo, and I promise I will not give any advice whether Britain should stay or not in the European Union. <laughs> After all, I'm Swiss, I'm neutral, and I have no opinion. So, uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, almost, you can assume that everything interesting and intelligent has been said before you. So I can concentrate on the rest. The rest is the kind of world in which we are going to operate, which is going to have a lot of impact on our strategy, because our life to all of us would be a lot easier if the world would stop interfering with our strategy precisely. So let's see where we are. And the world of today is going to be a world of volatility, an enormous amount of it. And volatility is when you wake up in the morning, you switch on the TV, and it says, 9 o'clock, share rise in early trading, breaking news, second breaking news. 10 o'clock, share plunge on news that share rose in early trading. <laughs> yeah, it goes into every direction today. So let's see the world economy. Let's see what is the 2016 lookout uh, or outlook. I don't know. You choose the one you want. It's one of the two, and let's see how the numbers and where we are. Where are we now? I think um, the numbers on Norway were just out 1.6%, a big slowdown, 1.0% on Norway mainland. This is the rest of Europe altogether. GDP growth, 12 months period of time, 1.5 for Europe, 2.4% for the US, getting better. Latin America, Brazil, minus 4.5%, a real tragedy. And if you are looking at Asia, China going not so well, Japan not either. These are the other countries. You can see that uh, in Europe, some countries are still doing very well, like uh, the United Kingdom doing very well. Um, why is it the case? I don't know. Maybe it is uh, British babies, the royal babies. I don't know. Maybe it is that. Um, maybe they should do that more often. You know, it pushes the thing. More. So that's where we are. We are in this situation where basically in Europe it's so so. If you are looking at uh, the rest of the world, uh, Canada, okay, Mexico is uh, improving a little bit. Latin America with a real tragedy in Venezuela, as you can see. And if you are looking at Asia, the various numbers show you that. India is still doing very well. We don't know for how long, but the rest of the economy is still relatively uh, soft. This is the best way we can uh, look ahead. So when you are looking at those numbers, you have to ask, uh, how can I forecast what's happening? And whenever you are in a world of low visibility, the question is, who do you trust? Are you, do you trust the stock markets? Well, actually, uh, Robert Rybin, who was uh, Secretary of the US Treasury, said one day, the stock market has predicted Nine of the last, nine of the last five recessions. <laughs> Which means that that for, I mean, goes in every direction. So don't trust the stock market. Do you trust statistics? That's another good one. Uh, in 2014, the United States of America, Q1, produced uh, first statistic on GDP growth. The first one was 0.1%. Two weeks later, they say, well, actually, maybe it's different. It's minus 1%. And two weeks later, they came back and they said the real number is minus 2.9%. And this is the US with the best statistical system in the world. Um, so, I mean, you have to be careful. Other numbers, Nigeria, two years ago, revised the GDP and increased it by 84%. <laughs> Same story with Europe, with China. Our friends in Britain have done even better. About a year and a half, the GDP was revised and they included in the GDP calculation gambling, Drug trafficking and prostitution. <laughs> Impact plus 1.2% on the GDP. As you can see, you never can be too innovative. So, basically, the real issue we have, we had a great recession. Of course, we expected a great recovery, but instead we had a great stagnation. And this is really the problem we are having now. And then we have some of my colleagues in the academic world said after this, we are going to have now what they call the eight years recession spell. Apparently, every seven, eight years, something goes wrong. So it will be 2016. The real problem, if it goes wrong, what ammunition have we left? Because we have used everything we could. So this is really the problem we are confronted with. Where do we go from there? And since, I mean, Norway, let's face it, oil has been a game changer. A real big one, because what was surprising with the oil price is that the oil price went down. This you know about it. Meanwhile, the production of oil has continued to go up and up and up. So now we have too much oil on the market, as you know. The stocks, including military, are 290 days. And really, this was a result of the US and, uh, and other countries coming into the market. But really, the name of the game is going to be defined basically by Saudi Arabia and Iran. 
And if you want to understand what's going to happen probably, and it has such an impact on all of you here, is basically the fact that the break-even price for oil and the barrel of oil, as you can see here, I mean, for example, uh, if you want companies to make money, most of them are around 55 to 65 dollars a barrel. Here in Norway, in order to make money, it has to be a little bit above 40 dollars. This is an average. But if you are looking at the others, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait in the lower end, it's 12 dollars a barrel. And the other one, like uh, the one coming on the market, like Iran and Iraq, is just a little bit more. So we are in a price war where the low-cost producers want to clean up the market from the expensive one, and that's why they continue to produce, even when we are today at $34 a barrel. So we are moving from oil sand to quicksands, and a lot of people are suffering about it, and it has an impact on, on budget. If you are looking at uh, Venezuela, they need a, a price of oil at $160 a barrel in order to balance the budget. Good luck, huh? Um, <laughs> Russia, $110. So actually, they will never make it. So it's going to have some repercussion on the market. Of course, the dilemma of oil is the following. I mean, people say it's good news. Two thirds of the world, uh, world country import oil and gas, so it should help them. Good news maybe also because it should boost household revenues. But I mean, the real issue is that actually it destabilizes a lot of economy today. And in a global world where some are destabilized, it has an impact on everybody else. And also, it destabilizes the advanced economy because we are refining, we are shipping, we are doing a lot of this, so everybody is impacting the situation. My feeling is going to stay low for at least one more year now, and by low I mean under $50 a barrel. So the next thing is, are the emerging economies still emerging? And this is really the question. Why does it matter first? Because when you are taking the BRICS, which you see on the left, the main Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey, Altogether, they have a GDP larger than the United States of America. Altogether, they have 50% of the world population. So if something goes wrong there, it goes wrong everywhere. And the IMF believes that when you have the drop of the GDP of minus 1% in the emerging market, it has an impact of minus 0.2% on everybody else. And this is really the problem we have seen during the past few months. We had slower growth in the emerging economy, currency going down, stock exchange going down, and this was a little bit of a mess because globally, the world economy has been slowing down. This is uh, the world trade. The world trade in one year's period of time in value has been going down by 13.8%. And another index which you know very well here, the Baltic Dry Index, is down 39%. So definitely something is happening the world economy is getting softer, and the real question is what are we going to do about it? Some people in the emerging economy have answered the question. They are taking the money out, and they are bringing it back to the advanced economy. So we are seeing a lot of money going out at the emerging market, $735 billion. And we are seeing, on the contrary, a lot of the public money in the sovereign fund going back to the Gulf, to China, and all these countries. So we have a lot of money floating around now, and I will come back to it. And actually, it is really the question, where is the money? If you are looking at foreign exchange reserves, I mean, in uh, Norway, you have $61 billion. This is the old money now. As a matter of comparison, the US has little foreign exchange reserves because the US basically, uh, the world is in dollars. You have Europe, you have my country, Switzerland, and you have Japan. But this is a new money. This is the one in the... Um, Emerging markets, as you can see, China, 3.2 trillion, and then you have Russia, Korea, Taiwan, India, Saudi Arabia, and Brazil. All together, $5.7 trillion. Now, the big news there is that it's going down. About six months ago, China was above $4 trillion, but they are bringing the money back home because they need the money and everybody is doing it. And then on the top of that, it has an impact on the sovereign funds. You know that very well in Norway because your sovereign fund has $855 billion, which means that every one of you in this room is a millionaire. We congratulations. <laughs> and it's changing also the ownership. You know, I'm from Switzerland, and if you take the five largest investment of your pension funds, three are Swiss companies, Nestle, Novartis, and Roche. So Nestle is much more Norwegian than most people think. <laughs> And then the corporate debt uh, that you find in the emerging market is going to be a problem. $27 trillion worldwide. 
In the emerging economy, it has been increasing by $9.2 trillion recently, uh, 3.2 trillion, sorry, 3.2 trillion in the emerging economy. And the real problem when those companies get debt in dollars is of course if the dollar goes up, if the interest goes up like it was the case in December, actually they are squeezed. And then in addition, the oil price is going down. So we may see a lot of companies probably getting into a very difficult situation in 2016 also in the emerging economies. The new currency landscape therefore is different. You know that traditionally, as I said, the world is in dollars. 44% of the world transactions are in dollars. Uh, oil is in dollars, commodities are in dollars. And when you are looking at this situation, about 60% of the world GDP, which means countries uh, accounting for 60% of the world GDPs are trading in dollars. But then there is one big country missing here, of course, it is China. And China, despite all its foreign currency reserve, has only 2.8% of the world transaction are made in renminbi. I think this is going to change. We are going to see the yuan being more and more a big currency traded everywhere, especially in London. And I have the feeling that maybe one day commodities, maybe oil, will be also sold in another currency than just the dollar. So the next question becomes, what about government? What are they doing about this situation? And, and if you are looking at the cascading effect, you know, everybody is speaking about debt. But uh, I take as an example the United States of America. The debt of the US, $18.8 trillion, but this is a central debt. You go one level down and you will see that California is swimming in debt, $777 billion. One level down, Detroit has $18 billion of debt. They're almost bankrupt, so this is a, a tragedy. Recently, yeah, last week, it was Philadelphia joining the club. So somewhere, sub-sovereign debt is going to become an issue. Same story in Europe. About a year and a half ago, Rome almost closed down. They didn't have money anymore. About eight months ago, Venice, the mayor, wanted to, sold, to sell the paintings because he couldn't pay anymore. Of course, the people did not agree. If you are looking at Spain, Catalonia and Valencia and Madrid are swimming into debt and Catalonia wants to become independent, that will help. Um, <laughs> in Germany, half of the lenders are swimming into debt. I mean, this is crazy. And even if you are looking at China, the Jiangsu province, the Jiangsu province, 79 million inhabitants, the Jiangsu province with a GDP larger than Turkey, the Jiangsu province, which should be in the G20, actually, has $2 trillion of debt. So actually, this is very disquieting. And you have to ask yourself what the governments are doing about it. And the answer is nothing. <laughs> Why? Because money is so cheap that you can borrow your way out. This is Japan and Switzerland today can borrow 10 years at negative rates, government bonds. Germany can borrow seven years at negative rates. And these are the others, Finland, the Ireland, and this is uh, Belgium, five years. France and Ireland and Sweden can borrow four years at negative yields, and then you are seeing the last one, Italy and Spain. So when it is so cheap, who cares about making savings? You just borrow money and that's finished. But this is very dangerous for the economy. What's happening in an economy when suddenly uh, savings are not rewarded? Do we think that uh, consumption will increase? No. Actually, we, the consumers, when we lose money by saving, what do we do? We save even more to compensate what we are losing by saving. <laughs> That's the way we do. And then you have the big question, the pension funds. How do you make your pension funds survive with negative interest rates and when you have more and more spending and when the people are getting older? So this is a very crazy situation. I don't think it can and it should be lasting long. The real issue is how do we work with governments? How do we convince government to do the right thing, and uh, maybe our friends in India found the solution. In India, there is a word which says the following, our economy is growing at night, and they add, when the government is sleeping. <laughs> How do you make the government sleep? That's another lecture. So basically, <laughs> the next question becomes, global company are submerged with cash. Not everybody who is running after money. So let's see the mountain of liquidity we have today. This is the amount of cash on the balance sheet of the large company in US, $1.7 trillion. In Europe, $1.3 trillion. And then you see Japan and you see a global estimate by, Glo by Bloomberg. If you are looking at the 50 largest US companies, they have $1.1 trillion on cash on the balance sheet. They are swimming in money. And if you are looking at the companies, 
obviously. Number one is Apple, $216 billion in cash, followed by uh, Microsoft and Google. You know, they are becoming more and more a bank. So basically, this is the first issue, and we are going to see later, where is this money? But the first question is, what do you do with it? When you are sitting on a mountain of cash, what do you do? Well, the first thing you do, you bring dividends to uh, your shareholders. We have never seen so much dividends as last year. Number two, you, uh, you, share, you do some share buyback. You buy back your shares, which has a good impact because it puts your shares price up. Company like Cisco are doing that all the time. And the last thing you do, of course, when you are sitting on tons of money, you are buying company abroad. And you are buying company anywhere. And we have never seen so many mergers and acquisitions as last year. It has been a breaking uh, a record year. Fantastic. And keep in mind that m and stands also for murder and assassination. <laughs> you buy and you kill. But the level of capital investment, the level of investment in the real economy is flat. It hasn't changed. And this is a problem we are having. So the real question we start to, to ask is what went wrong with the economy? And you remember, ladies and gentlemen, that when you were learning economics, kids, they told you when the economy is going badly, what do you do? Number one, you print money. Number two, with the money you have print, you build something. It's possible a dam. Then you are paying the workers with money. And with the money of the workers, they go in a shop and they buy something and the economy recovers. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Keynes' theory. It takes me one year to uh, teach that at the university and now you get the 30 second version. So, but that's all you need to know, basically. <laughs> now you don't, should not say that to my students, but still, <laughs> that's all what you need to know. And the real question is the following. We say, okay, we print money, so far so good. But there is the money we printed, we bailed out the banks, we bailed out the government. And then the problem is that the money went back, went back into the banks, went back into finance, and actually didn't go to the shop, didn't go to the real economy. And that's why the economy is not booming. There is a very simple explanation and proof of that. If all the money we had printed would have gone into the real economy, we would have inflation, not deflation. And this is exactly what we are struggling with today. And when you are looking at people, we start to see a policy mix. On one hand, people are looking at monetary policy that they are printing money like confettis. On the other side, we are looking at budget policies and people are giving austerity measures, contracting, and then we are in complete schizophrenia. People are telling us, do we have money or we don't have money? <laughs> Tell us. And this is a problem. And the problem is that, you know, I could not resist, uh, even if it's not the, the Nobel Prize of Peace, but the Nobel Prize was awarded recently, and this is a new one. The Nobel Prize goes to Mrs. Jones for keeping her savings at home. <laughs> you know, I'm in a country where the booming business is to have a safe, and you put cash in the safe, so at least you don't pay negative interest rates. This is wrong, and this is very bad for the economy. So the government wants their share of global profits. What are they doing? They want more transparency in the economy. You know, they want to kill the tax haven. They want to kill tax inversion. And when they are looking at those companies I've just mentioned, the Apple, the Google, and the others, they suddenly realize that Apple has 93% of the cash abroad, that uh, Microsoft 90%, and Google 58%. The money is not going back. And where is this money? According to a US Senate inquiry, 60, no, 55% of it is in Bermuda, Ireland, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Singapore, and just a little bit in Switzerland. But basically, <laughs> it's out. It doesn't go back. Why? Because the US has a tax rate of 35%. So they don't want to bring the money back at this tax rate. The Obama administration estimated that $2.1 trillion is abroad and not coming back. So there is a very big fight to bring the money back and to reform the tax system according to two principles. The first principle is that profit should be taxed where money is generated and not where the company is registered. So you make money in Germany, you pay taxes in Germany, and you have seen last year Starbucks and everybody start to report profits and revenues by territory, by region. I don't care if you are registered in Ireland or the Luxembourg or elsewhere, pay where you make your revenues. And number two, what is legal is not perceived by public opinion as being legitimate, which means Tax ruling are legal, but everybody says, I don't care, I think this is wrong. And here we have a very big problem with public opinion. In addition, transparency becomes the name of the game, transparency and accountability. 
Uh, companies are fined heavily. We have $235 billion of fines which have been given recently. This is enormous. Uh, and in addition, you have companies being fined like BP, like Volkswagen, which has earmarked 19 billion euros in case they are going to be fined. So the situation today is very tricky because company can disappear if they do something wrong. And of course, because the government needing money, they do everything they can to find the money. One day, uh, William Gladstone, the British Prime Minister, was vi visiting the labs of Michael Faraday, and he asked the question, Mr. Faraday, what is the use of all these inventions? Answer of Mr. Faraday, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm not quite sure, but I know that one day you will tax them. <laughs> government today try to find any kind of solution to tax companies and to tax people. So basically, compliance has become a nightmare on the top of that, just because of what I have said. And if you just take the US as an example, they have the Dodd-Frank Act. Inside the Dodd-Frank Act, they have the Volcker Rules on trading. And the Volcker Rules on banking trading their own money is 297,000 world long. Can you imagine? How can you survive that 297,000 words? Impossible. Actually, 2,970,000 words long. If you compare it, the New Testament has only 181,000. <laughs> and it gives you a lot more hope. <laughs> All this was very well summarized by the President James Madison in the US who said it will be of little help to the people if the laws are so voluminous that they cannot be read or so incoherent that they cannot be understood. Nobody has said it better. And I think it is true. I mean, all of us in this audience, we are downloading things from internet and every time we download something appears this screen, terms and conditions. Do you read it? No, of course not. We just have push on accept. <laughs> and we are right not to read it because if we would read it, we would spend. 250 hours a year <laughs> reading this nonsense. <laughs> so you go into the opposite direction, and as it was very well summarized by President Harry Truman in the US, if you cannot convince them, then confuse them. <laughs> and that's exactly where we are. <laughs> Meanwhile, the consumer, all of us, we are buying differently, of course. And if you are looking at the change in the mentality of people in prosperity, you are starting with the first buy economy. Take your cellular phone. I need a phone. I need it. I buy it. And then with time, you go in what I call a replacement economy. I, uh, I have a phone, but I buy a new one. I have a TV. It's a new one. I have a car. It's a new one. You replace an older product, and in your mind, it's not I need it, but I want it. You don't need your next cellular phone. You want it. It's a different story. And then you go. With the peer pressure economy, I have to have it. Ask your children, why do they want an iPhone 6? Do you need it? No. Do you want it? No. So I need to, I have to have it because my friends have one. <laughs> peer pressure is the name of the game. And sometimes it's going so fast that we cannot catch up with all this technology. Here the guy is saying, your problem is that your smartphone is overqualified. <laughs> and it's true. The technology we have sometimes is over us. And the attitude was very well summarized by uh, George Bernard Shaw, who said one day our necessities are fused, but our wants are endless. And we are in a world where companies are selling on what we want and not on what we need. And of course, the master there was Steve Jobs. You remember when uh, he uh, came with the iPad a few years ago? Nobody in his right mind needed an iPad. But then Steve Jobs came and said, relax. With the iPad, it will simplify all the tasks that you never had to do before. <laughs> it's a new world, huh? New global brands all over the world. I think one of the most striking things I think in the economy today is the explosion of new brands coming from emerging economies. You know, it used to be a small, cozy world. We used to know everybody. And suddenly, you find all those companies, the higher and the others, coming into the market the Xiaoming, et cetera. It's a world of new brands, and I think we have to be careful. The emerging market is going to be there, very competitive with global brands. And I think this explosion is not only an explosion of large companies. I think one of the biggest issues today is family-owned business. 
If you are looking family-run business, about $1 billion in turnover. We have between 19 and 25% in Europe. But if you are looking at the rest of the world, 85% of the business above $1 billion in Southeast Asia is family-run. Family business is extremely important. According to McKinsey, in 2025, 15,000 companies worldwide will be above $1 billion. And actually, 37% of them are going to come from the emerging market and will be family business. This is going to be huge for the future. And I think we have to be careful about that. Keep in mind, at the very beginning, India, uh, emerging market, they provide low-cost work. Very rapidly, they become a market provider like China, but very rapidly, it's become a brand provider. You, we used to be in Europe and the US, the only brand providers. Now it's coming to go our direction very quickly. A lot of brands coming from the emerging markets. Doesn't mean globalization is going to stop. It's going to continue. If you are looking at this little kid who said the following, he tells his mother, good news, I got top grades. And he had, I outsourced my homework to a kid overseas. <laughs> globalization is there. But the new markets emerge everywhere. And I think you have to keep in mind the size. The size, Norway, my country, Switzerland, we have a problem of size. This is the world economy today in terms of numbers. In 2050, North America will have 100 million people plus. 2050, Latin America, 190 million people plus. Europe will be more or less stable. Africa, fasten your seatbelt, plus 1 billion people, and Asia, plus 1 billion. So the world is going to increase. It's fabulous for technology. Keep in mind, in, 2040, in 2044, the US and Nigeria will have the same population, 420 million people. This is just enormous. So I think size will matter. And inside that, one of the big opportunities, the people emerging out of poverty, $1.9 a day. Now it's only 12.7% of the population. According to the World Bank, you escape poverty at $1.9 a day. You become middle class at $10 a day. But what happened in between? In between, you have 2.8 billion people who need a business model for them, a business model which is going to be important. A new business model, which you can see in Africa. If you take Africa, these are the people who have a bank account by country. Everybody is under 50%. But if you are looking at the people who have a mobile phone, everybody is above 50%. And it tells you that we have to use mobile telephony as a mean of transaction. Kenya is doing it and many other countries. We have to reimagine that. Actually, in the world, 2 billion people do not have a bank account, which is quite extraordinary. So at the end of the day, the mindset is a key to succeed, and I would like to conclude on that. Number one, when you don't know where you are going, think about what Epictetus said. He said, actually, it's not what happens to you that matters, but how you react to it. And resilience and reaction is the name of the game. One day, one person told me in a company, that's why it's anonymous, he said, you're right, in my company we have a problem. We study a good idea until it becomes a bad one. <laughs> the more you think, the more it becomes a bad one. Why are entrepreneurs are so good? Because they don't think too much. <laughs> Success. I hope I have no entrepreneurs after me. Success. It also can be dangerous. Picasso used to say the following. He says, success can be dangerous. You tend to copy yourself. It's more dangerous than to copy the others. It leads to sterility. It's true. When you are successful, you don't want to change. You only want to change when you have a crisis. And this is a big problem. You need to be self-reliant. You need to be able to react by yourself and be self-reliant. This is a lady which is telling the little boy, actually, no, you cannot call the help desk. Try to be self-reliant. Try to make sure that you are only doing it by yourself. Try also to remain positive. Remember George Bernard Shaw, who one day said the following. He said, actually, I have spent most of my life worrying about things. That never happened. <laughs> and it's true. When you think about it, very often we over-worried about the situation. Understand the impact of technology. Not technology, the impact of it. Automation, clearly, what will be the impact on the workforce? Convergence, for example, in agriculture of technology. Sharing, C2C, big thing. And then, of course, pervasiveness of technology and connectivity. The name of the game is the impact, and not so much the technology, 
how it will change our life, how it will change our business model. One day, um, Albert Einstein was finally appointed as a professor, and as a professor, he used to do something a little bit tricky. At every single exam, he used to put the same questions, which is a good way to become popular to your students. So basically, the same question. And one day, one of these assistants here came to see Professor Einstein and said, listen, Professor, you know, you're always asking the same question. Should you not change? And Einstein came back and he said the following, you are right, the questions are the same, but in between, the answers are different. And that's exactly where we are now. The questions are the same, but the answers are different, and we have to adapt to these answers. So let me conclude. What are the rules of success? Number one, you need to have a very strong layer, which should be the management of efficiency, number one. Number two, you should have the management of change. The world is changing, no matter what is happening. Number three, the management of complexity. The world is complex. Let's simplify it for our customers and for ourselves. And then on the top of that, you need a mindset. A mindset of imagination, answering the question, why not? Robert Kennedy used to say you have two types of people in the world. Those who are looking at the world the way it is. And they always ask the question, why? And those who are dreaming of things that never were, and they ask the question, why not? We need why not people, not why people. We need people with energy, why not doing it now? And we need people with a sense of commitment. Why not me? The problem is that today we have in companies a lot of people who have as an attitude, why me? I didn't do anything. <laughs> commitment is the name of the game. And let me conclude also legitimacy. Why us? Why should we do it? Why are we legitimate to do it? So ladies and gentlemen, it's good that you had a beer before because this is a world today. And to summarize, since of course we have the US president elections, I want to conclude with somebody who won the election, President Reagan, and who said one day the following, he said, in life you have three types of people. Number one, those who let it happen. Number two, those who make it happen. And number three, those who wonder what happened. <laughs> I hope you will not be part of the third one. Thank you very much indeed.